Hi, I'm Brett Champion, Superintendent of Schools here in the Medford School District. We started the book No Talking, and today we're going to pick up where we left off last time. She smiled. That's right. Decimals really do make things easier. Tyler raised his hand and said, with a calculator, which got a laugh from the whole class. And as they laughed, Dave and Lindsay looked at each other for about half a second. Not quite a friendly look, but similar. <laughs> then Dave thought, this means the contest is still on. And he wasn't sure how he felt about that. The class sailed through the rest of the conversion problems, miles to kilometers, kilograms to ounces, acres to hectares, on and on. And every student responded using three words or less or with written answers on the board. Mrs. Escobar knew the kids weren't obeying Mrs. Hyatt. She knew they were still counting words, still keeping silent unless called on. But honestly, at this moment, she didn't care. She was in the middle of an amazingly productive class period, and everyone was so focused, so alert, so engaged. Compared to the classroom experience she'd had with these same kids just 24 hours ago, well, it was like night and day, and she liked the day much better. And what was happening in the other first period classrooms on Wednesday, classrooms where Lindsay and Dave were not on hand to provide some leadership? As science class began, Mrs. Marlowe had already decided to make an example of the first kid who gave her a three-word answer, and it happened to be Kyle. I asked you to tell me about the order Lepidoptera, Lepidoptera, the teacher said. Kyle nodded. Butterflies and moths, he repeated. And that's all you know, she said. He nodded again, pretty much, which got a giggle from the class. Mrs. Marlowe grabbed a notepad and picked up a pencil, reading out loud as she wrote, Dear Mrs. Hyatt, Kyle has refused to obey your instructions. He is not participating in class discussion, and he... Kyle raised his hand, and Mrs. Marlowe snapped, What? I'm participating. No, she said. You're deliberately using as few words as possible, and you are disobeying the principle. Kyle shook his head. I'm conserving, she said. That's nonsense. Conservation means... Kyle finished the sentence. Not wasting. Mrs. Marlowe glared at him. Conservation is for energy and water and soil and forests. Words don't need conserving. Maybe they do, Kyle said, which was awfully brave of him. And all the kids in the class nodded their agreement with Kyle, which was also very brave. Mrs. Marlowe felt herself getting angry. However, she was an extremely logical person, and she had to admit that Kyle had a point. Anybody who had ever eaten lunch in the teacher's room or sat through a whole faculty meeting would have to agree that a lot of words got wasted every school day. And all that endless gabbing that had made the unshushable so famous, 99% waste. But she said, regardless of that, the principal said you must all participate normally in class. Kyle scrunched up his face. What's normal? Mrs. Marlowe said, in this case, it means talking the way the principal wants you to, the way I want you to, the way everyone usually talks and answers normally. Kyle said, can normal change? Well, said, and Mrs. Marlowe paused. She paused because just three days ago, they had discussed climate change, and she had explained how a normal high temperature now would have been considered abnormal 100 years ago. And she knew Kyle would remember that. The whole class probably remembered. This was a very bright group. She continued, yes, you could say that, but it's certainly not normal to use only three words at a time or no words at all, not at school. Cal shrugged, works for me. Mrs. Marlowe thought back to all the times in the past week when she'd had to yell at Kyle about his nonstop whispering, about his constant joke-telling, about his never-ending comments on anything and everything that ran through his twitchy little head, and she looked at Kyle sitting there quietly, giving her his full attention, and every other student was doing the same thing. And suddenly, the idea of trying to make these kids talk, actually demanding that they all go back to being noisy, self-absorbed chatterbrains, it simply wasn't logical. So Mrs. Marlowe decided to go ahead with her lesson for the day, and she adjusted herself to the new normal because the new normal was at least 10 times better than the old normal. In social studies, there were, e there were more oral reports, and Mrs. Overby called on Ed Canner and Bill Harkness to go first. The boys walked to the front of the room, stood shoulder to shoulder, and both of them looked down at the index cards in Bill's hands. Ed said, Italy is old. Then Bill said, The Roman Empire, and Ed said, Ruled the world, and Bill said, For many centuries. And Mrs. Overby said, what do you two boys think you're doing? Ed said, giving our report. And Bill said, on Italy. No, said the teacher, you're still playing that game, counting the words. But we practiced, Ed said. We're ready, Bill said. And Ed said, can we finish? Like the other teachers up and down the fifth grade hall, Mrs. Overby had to make a decision. Go with the flow, which promised to be very quiet and orderly, or call for the principal, raise a ruckus, and try to force these kids to be their regular old noisy selves again. 
As a student of history, Mrs. Overby knew about the power of grassroots movement. She also knew about the power of civil disobedience. But mostly, she decided that this no-talking craze was actually a pretty good social experiment. Plus, she didn't feel like the kids thought they were winning and she was losing. It wasn't like that. They were just having a different kind of communication experience. Together. That's all. True, Ed and Bill's report on Italy was choppy and awkward and a little hard to follow as they passed the narration back and forth like a ping-pong ball. But the boys made all their points, learning took place, and the whole class sat silently and paid close attention. And the next five reports went almost as smoothly. What more could a social studies teacher ask for? So like the other teachers, Mrs. Overby chose the quiet way. And she decided she'd talk to the other teachers later in the morning and see how they were handling this thing too. And she'd talk to Mrs. Hyatt too. Language arts was the easiest class for the kids. Mr. Burton didn't even try to make them stop their activity. If they wanted to be quiet and talk only in three-word bursts, he was all for it, no matter what the mighty Mrs. Hyatt had said. After all, this was his classroom, wasn't it? And if he believed this way of using words could provide a good language arts learning experience, then couldn't he proceed with it? Yep, absolutely. But he wasn't foolish. He walked to the back of the room, stuck his head out in the hallway, looked both ways, and then closed the door. Back at the front of his room, Mr. Burton said, Eric and Rachel, please come up and sit in these chairs. When they were seated, he said, You two are going to have a short debate. A debate is an orderly argument, and each of you will take opposite sides on the same issue. And the question is, should there be soft drink machines in school cafeterias? Rachel, you will argue for this question, and Eric, you will argue against it. You will take turns speaking, and you may use no more than three words for each statement. Ready? Eric and Rachel shook their heads no. Mr. Burton said, don't worry. You'll both do fine. Eric, you first, and you may begin. Eric said, soft drinks, bad. Rachel shook her head and said, not bad, delicious. Eric frowned, too much sugar. Rachel said, I like sugar. Eric shook his head. Sugar rots teeth. Rachel smiled a big smile. Not mine. Eric said, milk is better. Rachel shrugged. Try sugar free. Eric said, still bad nutrition. Rachel held up her arm and made a muscle. I eat vegetables. Eric said, not everyone does. Rachel said, I like choosing. Eric said, soda is expensive. Rachel pulled a dollar from her pocket. I have enough. Eric said, Spend it smarter. Rachel said, what about freedom? Eric shook his head, not at school. Rachel smirked, very bad news. And they went on like that for about five minutes with no let up. All the kids were fascinated, and of course, so was Mr. Burton. He took furious notes, writing down each response, trying to record the kind of gestures the kids made, their facial expressions, their tones of voice. Very few words were being exchanged, but whole worlds of ideas were floating around as the kids tried to build their arguments. They got emotional, and the three-word limit was clearly a problem. Still, they packed a lot into so few words. It was like debating with condensed haiku. It was also sort of like listening to cave people talk, or maybe Tarzan, hungry eat now, and Mr. Burton wrote some three-word chunks of his own, which he intended to use in his human development paper. Every word counts. Choose power words. Hemingway would approve. <laughs> Focus and narrow. Ideas are collapsible. Remember Miles Davis. And as he looked at what he wrote, he thought, maybe I should write my whole paper using three-word sentences. That would certainly get the attention of my professor. In music class, the kids entered the room and sat silently just like yesterday afternoon. Mrs. Akers was sure the students were going to disobey Mrs. Hyatt's orders, and she was ready to take some drastic steps to stop this nonsense. But when she played an introduction and launched into Over the River and Through the Woods, everyone sang right out. The teacher was amazed. Mrs. Akers felt like there had been a glorious victory for the forces of law and authority, and she intended to write the principal a special note to say thanks for her strong leadership. In fact, the principal's talk was not the direct cause of the singing. Taryn had written a simple note, and she'd shown it to all the boys and girls as they came into the music room. Singing is not talking, deal? And by nodding, all the boys and all the girls had silently agreed that bending the contest rules a little was a good idea. Besides, no one wanted the Thanksgiving music program to sound lousy, and their contest would be over by then anyway. The boys and girls in that first period music class might not have noticed it, but the important thing was not that they had agreed to sing. The important thing was that they had agreed about anything. Fifth grade boys and fifth grade girls at Laketon Elementary School were actually cooperating and helping each other.
And that's what ha was happening in the other fifth grade classrooms too. The boys and girls had joined forces without even realizing it. Together, they had resisted the pressure from the principal and from their teachers. They had used their wits and teamed up to prove that not talking was a simple, harmless activity. It wasn't like the boys and girls were getting all buddy-buddy or anything, and it wasn't like the teasing and taunting had completely stopped, because old habits are hard to break. But still, cooties were dying all over the place. That was one result. Another result of the morning class was that the kids had won a new kind of respect from their teachers. Teachers have great respect for order and self-discipline. Teachers love to make careful plans and then put them into action. It's what they do. <laughs> and teachers hate noise and disorder in bouncing kids because these things keep them from accomplishing their careful plans. However, there was one gigantic problem with all this harmony and order and balance and peace that was blooming in the fifth grade hall. Mrs. Hyatt wasn't in the loop. She was clueless about these new developments. In fact, the principal wasn't even in the building during the morning. She was across town, district office. She was across town at the district offices working on next year's budget. She had left her trusty teachers to carry out her strict orders. But Mrs. Hyatt had organized her meetings to be sure she would be back at her school in time for fifth grade lunch, because the principal felt sure she would be needed at lunch with her bullhorn to keep law and order, just like always. Because Mrs. Hyatt had complete confidence in her teachers. She was sure that by lunchtime, everything would be back to normal. Chapter 18, Adventures in the Red Zone. Mrs. Hyatt got back to her school at 11.59. There were several messages on her desk, and Mrs. Overby had taped a note on her chair that read, please come see me in the teacher's room. But the principal was in a hurry. She needed to be on time for fifth grade lunch. Five minutes later, for the second day in a row, Mrs. Hyatt found herself standing in the middle of a silent cafeteria holding a big red plastic bullhorn. But today it was different. She looked around the quiet room and the sight of all these fifth graders deliberately disobeying her. Well, it nudged her over the edge. It pushed her right into the red zone. She gritted her teeth and an angry haze filled her mind. And she knew she was angry and she knew it wasn't good to be angry, but she was. And she knew it wasn't good to be angry and try to talk to children at the same time, but she couldn't help herself. She had to talk to these kids right now. She would have, she could have whispered and every fifth grader would have heard her, but she didn't whisper. She pulled the trigger on the bullhorn. Have you forgotten our assembly this morning? The principal's voice echoed off the walls. The kids stared at her. She aimed the bullhorn at Dave and yelled, David Packer, answer me. Do you remember what I told all of you this morning? When Dave nodded his head, she yelled out, Answer me with your voice out loud. So Dave swallowed his first bite of macaroni and cheese and said, I remember. His voice sounded very small. Dave felt like he was the scarecrow talking to the great and powerful Oz. Mrs. Hyatt took five steps closer to Dave and shouted, Then why aren't you talking with your friends? Dave had never seen Mrs. Hyatt this mad before, and no one had ever yelled at him with a bullhorn. It seemed unfair to be yelled at with a giant voice. So he decided he wasn't going to be afraid or angry, no matter what. Dave shrugged and said, nothing to say, which was perfectly true. Before Mrs. Hyatt had started yelling, he had been very happy to just sit and eat and think. Stand up! Dave stood up. Every kid in the room was watching him, and so was Mrs. Marlowe and the custodian and the cafeteria workers. Mrs. Hyatt said, talk! I want, to, I want you to talk right now. I want to hear you tell Todd everything you learned in all your classes this morning. Start talking to Todd now. Dave wasn't an angry sort of kid. Not usually. In fact, there was only one thing that nudged him over the edge, being bullied. The only time he'd ever gotten into a fight at school was back in second grade when a fifth grader had started picking on him. That's when Dave had learned that you can't just go along with a bully because then you get bullied more and more, and that's how Dave felt right now. He was getting mad. It felt like Mrs. Hyatt was being a bully, a bully with a bullhorn. Again, the principal yelled, Talk! And that did it. It was Dave's turn for a trip to the red zone. He glared at Miss Hyatt, and he shouted, I do not have to talk now if I don't want to. This is our lunchtime. None of us have to talk. And a sentence flashed into Dave's mind, something he had heard dozens of times on TV shows. This sentence was usually being said to criminals wearing handcuffs, but that didn't seem to matter at the moment. Dave looked around in the cafeteria and his classmates, and he shouted, You have the right to remain silent. And with that, Dave pressed his lips together, folded his arms across his chest, and sat down. Lindsay was the first to pick up on Dave's body language. She looked at Mrs. Hyatt and slowly folded her arms. All the girls at her lunch table did the same. 
and the gesture spread throughout the room like ripples on a pond. Every kid stared at the principal, arms folded and stone silent. Mrs. Hyatt looked around slowly, drew herself up to her full height, and then walked briskly out of the room. She walked down the hall to the school office. She nodded at Mrs. Chaplin, the school secretary, and said, hold my calls. Then she went into her own office and closed the door. Back in the cafeteria, it was dead calm. Every kid sat motionless, arms still folded, not sure what to do next. Todd started it. He unfolded his arms and nodded at Dave, and then he clapped his hands. In three seconds, every fifth grade boy was clapping like mad. Dave looked around at his friends and smiled and nodded, and a second later, guess who joined in? That's right, all the girls. And five seconds later, the hooting and the whooping began. It was loud in that cafeteria. It was incredibly loud. The clapping and cheering was so loud that the sound went right through the cafeteria doors and walls and thundered down the hall all the way to the school office and right through the closed door of Mrs. Abigail Hyatt, principal. The phone on Mrs. Chaplin's desk buzzed, an intercom call. Yes, she answered. The secretary listened, nodded, and said, right away. She got up and walked out of the office and down the hall and into the cafeteria where it had gotten quiet again. Mrs. Marlowe was standing near the doorway and Mrs. Chaplin whispered something to her. Mrs. Marlowe nodded and quickly walked halfway across the room. She bent down close to Dave Packer's ear and said, To the office. Dave swallowed his third bite of macaroni and cheese and looked up into the science teacher's face. I have to? She nodded. Principal's orders. Dave looked around the table at his friends. No one needed to speak a word. Their faces said it all. And the message, three simple words, and Dave believed them. You are dead. <laughs> Chapter 19. Apologies. There were 227 green tile squares on the hallway floor between the cafeteria and the school office. Dave counted each one to keep from thinking about what was going to happen next, but he thought about it anyway. Mrs. Chaplin pointed at the principal's door. Go right in. Dave knocked. He knew he didn't have to, but, he, but it bought him another two seconds of delay. Mrs. Hyatt said, come in, and Dave thought, at least she's not using her bullhorn. He opened the door, and she was standing with her back to him, looking out the windows into the school courtyard. Dave blurted out, I'm sorry, and he said that because he knew he shouldn't have yelled at the principal, even if he had been right, which he still believed he was. He also apologized because he hoped it might help save his life. Mrs. Hyatt turned around, and Dave was shocked to see the look on her face, because she wasn't mad. She almost looked like she'd been crying, and her nose was pink. She shook her head. That's why I sent for you, so I could say that. I'm the one who got angry, and I yelled first, and I set a terrible example. So I hope you'll forgive me. Dave couldn't remember, <laughs> Dave couldn't remember the last time a grown-up had apologized to him, and to have the principal saying she was sorry, well, he could barely manage a nod at her. She nodded back and then paused and said, So. What are we going to do about this situation? Um, not sure, Dave said. She frowned. Please, you can talk freely in here. None of your friends can hear us. Dave shook his head. Honor system. Mrs. Hyatt's eyebrows went up. Oh, of course. Very admirable. Well, maybe you can answer some questions for me just to get started. Dave said, sure. First of all, how did all this get going? Who started it? Dave smiled. Mahatma Gandhi. Pardon me? Mrs. Hyatt said. Dave said, he stopped talking. The principal said, and someone wanted to try that here at school, right? Dave nodded and pointed at himself. All my fault. I see, she said. How did you learn about Gandhi? He said, social studies report. And why did he stop talking? Dave shrugged to think more. But you're not keeping silent. Not totally. Why? Dave thought a moment, then said, respect for school which he knew was going to make him sound like a goody-goody, but it was true. He and his friends weren't trying to shut down the school, not at all. Mrs. Hyatt nodded slowly and said, oh. She seemed to be out of questions. And during that three or four seconds of silence, an idea jumped into Dave's mind, but he pushed it out. It was too outrageous. But the idea bounced back into his head, and this time Dave just blurted it out. Want to join? Mrs. Hyatt bunched her eyebrows together. What do you mean? Join. Stop talking. She looked at Dave as, as if he had just told her to put on a grass skirt and dance the hula on the roof of a school bus. Don't be silly. I'm the principal. Do you have any idea how many people I have to speak to every single day? Dave pointed at a notepad on her desk. May I? She nodded, and he wrote, 
you can say only three words in a row, and only if a teacher or a grown-up talks to you first, except you can talk to a kid first because you're sort of a teacher and no talking at all outside of school honor system. And the whole thing's almost over anyway, just until tomorrow. Then Dave, smi <laughs> then Dave smiled up at her and said, it's interesting. Mrs. Hyatt shook her head. I could never. Dave put up his hand like a traffic officer. There, stop, three. Mrs. Hyatt smiled, and it wasn't a principal smile. Dave could tell. She was smiling a real person smile. She smiled because she realized Dave had offered her something important. Just five minutes earlier, she had acted like, like a monster. But she wasn't, not really. Still, she had behaved terribly. Everyone in the cafeteria knew that, kids and grown-ups both. And news like that spreads quickly. So somehow, she needed to remind everyone that she wasn't a monster, fast. And David just offered her a way to become human again. Because it's a well-known fact that monsters do not have a sense of humor. <laughs> she tore Dave's sheet off the notepad, bent over the desk, and did some writing of her own. She stepped quickly into the office and handed Mrs. Chaplin the paper. The secretary read it over and said, And I should. The principal held up one finger and said, Type. Then she held up two fingers and said, Duplicate. Then she held up three fingers and said, Distribute. And Mrs. Chaplin said, Got it. Then turning to Dave, the principal said, Ready, set, go. Dave's head was spinning, but he managed to say, Where? She was already out of the office door, and over her shoulder, Mrs. Hyatt said, To the cafeteria. Chapter 20, The Winners. At this point, it might be fun to tell how Dave followed the principal back to the cafeteria and how Mrs. Hyatt apologized to the whole fifth grade by trading three-word phrases back and forth with Dave who also apologized, and describing the looks on the faces of all those fifth graders in the cafeteria, not to mention Mrs. Marlowe and the rest of the staff. That might be fun, too. Or it might be interesting to tell how Mrs. Hyatt called an all-school assembly five minutes later by chiming the school intercom and then saying, everyone, auditorium, hurry, and how all the teachers in every grade were given five minutes at the assembly to explain the new no-talking rules to their students and how loud and confusing it was as they did that, and then how completely quiet it got when the principal announced, silence starts now. And it might be enlightening to explain how Mrs. Hyatt had changed the contest so that kids in kindergarten through fourth were competing grade against grade to see who could say the fewest illegal words during the next 23 hours and why she thought her way was a better idea than boys against girls. And it might be thought-provoking pro thought to explain how Dave felt about all this, how he felt that he was sort of like Gandhi and how Mrs. Hyatt was sort of like the British Empire and how he felt like there had been a great victory with liberty and justice for all, which included Mrs. Hyatt herself. And Mr. Burton, there's a lot that could be told about him because he went completely stratospheric. He spent the last 24 hours of the contest scribbling down notes, taking photos, and using a little handheld recorder to capture as many three-word sentences as possible. He collected so much great material that he began thinking that he could not only write that paper for his human development course, he could practically write a whole book about the way the kids and teachers at Laketon Elementary School had changed the way they expressed themselves, changed their view of language itself, what it is and how it works and how communication can take so many different forms. And speaking of human development, it might be fun to explore why the very youngest kids could not even imagine how to go without something as amazing and powerful as talking, not even for 10 minutes, which is why the whole kindergarten was ex immediately excused from this activity. And how, uh, and, about, and how about Thursday morning when the boys reported zero honor system word goofs and the girls reported only one? Telling how Dave and Lindsay reacted to that news would be revealing. And then it would certainly be fun to peek at the challenges Mrs. Hyatt faced as she kept to a strict diet of three words at a time. On Wednesday afternoon and again on Thursday morning, she talked with parents, with the superintendent, with the principals of other schools, with the electrician who arrived to repair the milk cooler, and of course, with her teachers and with hundreds of kids, all of whom thought it was great to have a principal who just might be a little bit crazy. In fact, the story could jump a whole week ahead or even months ahead to see the way the fifth graders completed the school year as kinder, more careful talkers and thinkers. Because there's absolutely more to tell, there's always more. But as tempting as it is, it's not the time to tell about all that. Because this is the time to jump right to fifth grade lunch on Thursday, right to that point when the original contest was coming to an end, right to that moment of truth when the boys and the girls were getting ready to compare their final scores. Because with all the goodwill and the happy vibes that swirled out of Mrs. Hyatt's change of heart, plus the excitement of having the whole school go quiet, you might think that somehow the fifth grade boys against girls contest didn't matter anymore, but it did. Remember when Dave stood up and shouted at the principal on Wednesday? Did you think no one was counting? Not true. Everyone was counting. Dave had said 30 words. Great. 
Grand words, brave and true. However, all but three of them were illegal. At 12.14, one minute before the end of that contest, the cafeteria was silent. Every fifth grader was watching the second hand on the big clock. And so were all the fifth grade teachers and Mrs. Hyatt and the custodian and the school secretary and the school nurse too. No one wanted to miss this moment in the history of the unshushables. Dave and Lindsay sat across from each other at the same table, ready for the big tally. Dave dug around in his back pocket and found the crumpled sheet listing all the points against the girls. And Lindsay pulled her little red notebook and a pencil out of her backpack. And she bent over it, adding and scribbling away. Glancing down, Dave saw something poking out of the top pouch of Lindsay's backpack. A huge permanent marker. A red one. And Dave had no trouble at all imagining a big L on his forehead. Because he already knew the final scores for both teams. And he was sure Lindsay did too. With just 15 seconds to go in the silent cafeteria, Lindsay stood up, looked down at the red notebook, took a deep breath, and, and talked. I have to say this. My whole opinion changed about boys. You really did the honor system great. And being quiet, also great. Everyone together. So, thanks. And then the second hand pointed straight up. And it was 12.15, and the contest was over. A yell went up that nearly peeled the tiles off the floor. Kids jumped out of their seats and ran and stood bouncing face to face with groups of friends and everyone jabbered faster and louder than human beings ever should, (laughs) laughing and nodding and telling everybody everything they were thinking and feeling. And the louder it got, the louder everyone had to talk to be heard above the rising tumult. And the sound spiraled up toward the point where dogs run and stick their heads under a sofa. And amid the burst of joy and noise and confusion, Lindsay shouted to Dave, "'What's the official count?' Dave nodded, cupped his hands around his mouth, and bellowed, 47 against the girls. Lindsay looked at her notebook. She didn't try to talk. It was too loud for that. She turned the notebook around, and at the bottom of the page, a number was circled, 74 against the boys, a huge defeat. Lindsay gave him an odd little smile, and Dave was ready for the teasing to begin. She shouted, she shouted you didn't count? He was confused. Count? Count what? Lindsay yelled as loud as she could. What I said at the end. Dave shook his head. What? The sound around them was deafening. Lindsay flipped a page and then turned the red notebook around so Dave could see it. And there was her whole little speech written out word for word. The last word was thanks. And above it, she'd written a number, 27. Dave nodded slowly as he stared at the speech and saw what Lindsay had done. He did the math in his head, seven plus seven and carry the one. She made the contest an exact tie. 74 points for each of them. And their private war, to see who got to label the other a loser, also a tie. Her 27 words matched the illegal ones he had yelled at Mrs. Hyatt. Was it all too perfect? Of course it was. Had Lindsay messed with the score against the boys to make it add up that way? Without a doubt. Would there be a big investigation? Not likely. Dave kept looking at the notebook. Lindsay's speech was filled with crossouts and changes. She had chosen those last words so carefully making each one count. He wanted to say, I owe you big time. He also wanted to say, I guess I'm pretty much of an idiot, aren't I? And most of all, he wanted to say what she had already said. Thanks. But Dave and Lindsay just sat there grinning at each other in the noisy cafeteria, and neither of them said a thing. Not one word. And that's the end of that story. Isn't that a great one? Andrew Clements does a terrific job with no talking. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care. A principal will make sure everyone is safe and like, and um, we don't run into any problems like, oh, What if we don't have enough money for all the field trips we're having? The principal always puts the big pictures for assemblies on the screen. Bring um, teachers to meetings to help them learn stuff. Make sure that the students are on task and following the rules. Whenever somebody comes to the office, they both solve their problems together and make a solution for every problem that they do. Have you ever had to go to the office and talk to the principal? Yes. What's that like? I actually went there today. She would find out some fundraisers for us to find 
um, enough money and so our school doesn't have any problems. If there wasn't a principal, it would probably be total chaos and the teachers would be arguing all the time. This whole entire school would be like so crazy that there would be people um, getting so crazy that they would be like throwing food all over the walls, pushing bookshelves down breaking stuff. Thank you for making the school the most wonderfulest place.